scripture reading this morning is taken from the Gospel of John, chapter chapter 20, uh, verses 30 and 31. John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. I believe one reason we do not sorrow as others who have no hope, as Seth mentioned, is perspective. From our perspective, we've lost a friend, a leader, a Christian, an example, an influencer. But from God's perspective, Psalm 116, verse 15, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. He welcomes one home who has chosen to serve him during this time on earth. There's a phrase bandied about quite often nowadays that I want to discuss for just a few moments. It's a phrase that we live in a post-Christian world. That takes a little bit of processing for me to understand that phrase and all the implications of it and just how exactly how I feel about it. It Used to be we we were called a post-modern world. Modern world before that. Modern during the Industrial Revolution I suppose. Post-modern after we got past that and had that all embedded into our society and into an information age. And now sociologists are calling Western civilization a post-Christian world. Now if someone means by that, that we get past all the corruptions of Christianity and the apostasies that have taken place throughout the centuries, then I'm all for it. I'm afraid though that's not what they mean by that. I'm afraid what they really mean is a post-Christ world. Western civilization to some degree or another, even with its corruptions and even with its influences for wrong and even with its misdeeds and sins was influenced greatly by the ethics and the morals of Christ. We were not built on Islamic fundamentals. We were not built on Buddhist fundamentals. We were not built on the ethics and the morals of the Hindu religions. We were not built on the worship of an emperor such as World War II Japan was. We were built upon the idea that people should love one another. And we were built upon the idea that people should regard human life as sacred and even above the other kinds of life that God provided for man to subdue. We were founded upon the idea that we ought to be people who hated murder, who despised stealing, whose integrity would bind us to our word, But without those kinds of principles, we see a society that starts to unravel in violence. A society that believes that if you lie, that's okay as long as the end justifies the means. And a society that believes that you can take whatever lives are unwanted. If that's what we mean by a post-Christian world, then I'm rather disturbed by it and I'm rather upset by it. Because only Christ can give the kind of relief from sin that needs to be given to the world. With all due respect to people throughout the world, Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through Him. And people who build their foundations upon anything else but Christ are building upon sand. The question I'd like to explore for the next few weeks is one that maybe has been brought up before. I know it has. Chad taught a class on Christian evidences for several weeks, a couple years back, and did a great job with it. About four or five years ago, I taught one lesson on this subject, but I'd like to expand it. I'd like to expand upon the idea of why we should even believe Jesus in the first place. And the reason I'd like to expand on that is not because I think you don't believe Jesus. You believe Jesus. You're here. You believe the Lord. You believe the Savior, Jesus Christ, to be the King of kings and Lord of lords. At least I would assume that for most of our assembly this morning. But the trouble is trying to get that across to what people are calling a post-Christian world. As I've said before and said many times, 50 or 60 years ago, you might be able to have a Bible study with someone and you would come without much discussion to a conclusion that the Bible was going to be your guide. You might be able to say to someone, if I could show you in the Bible where something is true, would you believe me? And they might cynically agree. The cynically part 
I would describe like this. They might say, yeah, I'll believe you if you can show me in the Bible, but I don't think you can show me in the Bible. Yet there was some sort of common respect. Those of you who can remember back 50 or 60 years, like me, can remember that most people had some sort of belief in God. Most people believed that Christ was the Son of God. They may not have lived by it. They may have corrupted His doctrine of faith. They may have corrupted His worship. But at least they believed that Christ was the Son of God. We're facing a society now where a lot of people, maybe most people, maybe a majority, don't believe that anymore and are therefore open to all sorts of pagan ideas. All sorts of ideas that are given to us by philosophers who are atheistic. All sorts of restructuring of society based on new philosophies of men. That's the kind of thing that I believe Paul was addressing to a pagan town in Corinth, as Chad mentioned in 2 Corinthians 10 verses 4 and 5, where the gospel of Christ casts down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of Christ. Well, we don't want that to be the case. We want it to be the case that people would believe Christ. But we have to back up and start at a different point, don't we? As we've stated on several occasions, the Apostle Paul did the same. In synagogues, he would start off his lessons with a reference to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And the people, the Jews, knew about whom he was speaking. But in pagan towns, he would have to back up from that because they wouldn't know what he was talking about if he started with the Jewish scriptures. He had to back up and start with their own philosophers and use their own philosophers against them quoting some of their philosophers to try to make the point that there was indeed an unseen God who was the one God who created everything because that was such a radical idea to most of the world in some of those cities. And it's a radical idea in a lot of our world and in Western civilization today. He would quote some of their own poets, for we are the offspring of God, Acts chapter 17. And that poet, I think with Cleanthes, might not have believed in God and might not have made the right points and might not have come to the right conclusions, but he had a phrase there that they could recognize that he could pull out and say, look, even one of your own poets said this. There is one God. Now we have a lot of reasons to believe in God the Father as creator and all of that sort of thing, but that's not what I want to cover right now. What I want to cover is why we would ask people to believe in Jesus. Why we would ask people to believe in our evangelistic nature that we must be. Why would we ask people to believe to follow his morals and his ethics because sometimes they seem binding to people. Why would we ask people to follow his pattern of worship and not whatever they feel like doing? Why would we ask people to believe that? First reason is simply because he, Jesus of Nazareth, is and was historically true. I think there are fewer people who do this nowadays, but there used to be a lot of people who would say, I don't think Jesus really even existed, and the whole Bible was just a fraud, and nobody even back then just wrote anything, and ne Jesus never walked the earth. There used to be a lot of people that would say that sort of thing. I think that might be shrinking, though I'm not sure. And the reason I think it might be shrinking is because of the information age. People can Google and people can search and people can find the secular historians who attest to the very nature of Jesus of Nazareth living on the earth in the first century AD as we've come to know it. He did walk the streets of Jerusalem. He was on the Sea of Galilee. He was in that area. Now these people, these secular historians, might not believe that Jesus was the Son of God. But in some cases, that makes their testimony even stronger. Do you know what it is in court to have a hostile witness? It means that you got somebody that's not for you. It's somebody that is not on your side. Somebody that does not want you to have your way in that court system, but brings to the table some important truth that actually helps your cause. Well, we have a lot of hostile witnesses to the existence of Jesus Christ. Do you realize that? There are a lot of references to Jesus, and I'm just going to go over a few of the very standard ones. There are a lot of references to Jesus from history in 100 AD and before, and just a little bit after, that testify to the fact that he really existed. Now, these people that I'm going to quote did not believe Jesus to be the Son of God. They were killing Christians. 
And yet their writings admit that Jesus of Nazareth really existed. And that has to be a starting point with some people. Consider the writings of Tacitus, who was a Roman historian, who wrote of the fire of Rome in A.D. 64. In A.D. 64, most of Rome caught fire, and Nero was blamed for it by a lot of the populace, and he wanted to get the blame off of him. And some people say that the reason, well, some people say that the way he got the blame off of him was to blame the Christians, because the pagans didn't like the Christians anyway, just like the pagans don't like Christians today. So they attached the blame to Christians. Here's what Tacitus said. Consequently, to get rid of the report that he'd burned Rome, Nero fastened the guilt and inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class hated for their abominations. Christians were abominations to people then. Called Christians by the populace. Then he says, Christus, that's a Latin form spelling of Christ, Christus, from whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our procurators, Pontius Pilate, and a most mischievous superstition, thus checked for the moment, again broke out not only in Judea, the first source of the evil, but in Rome. You can see this is not Christian propaganda, as some people would put it. He calls Christianity an evil. He calls the things that Christians were doing abominations. But he's writing in the first century, around 100 AD, about the things that happened. And he says, Christ died the extreme penalty, which everybody knew to be crucifixion, at the hands of Pontius Pilate. And that much is what the four Gospels say about Christ as well. That's from a hostile witness. Another hostile witness was Suetonius, writing on the career of Claudius. Claudius was the emperor of Rome from A.D. 41 to 54. He's mentioned in Acts chapter 18 verse 2 as casting the Jews out of Rome. Well, here's what Suetonius had to say about Claudius and that particular incident. He said, Since the Jews constantly made disturbances at the instigation of Crestus, another alternate spelling of Christ, he expelled them from Rome. Well, that just goes right along with what Acts 18 verse 2 says. And Suetonius was not a believer. Suetonius did not follow Christ. He did not worship in Christian ways. But what he's talking about is the conflicts the Jews had with Christians during that time when the gospel was spreading that we read about in the book of Acts. And because of those conflicts, Claudius said, just all of you, get out. To, them, to him, they were all Jews. But to them, they might have been Jewish Christians. Another hostile witness was Pliny, who was not a historian, but he was an emissary on behalf of the emperor who went around carrying out the emperor's business. What he was doing was going out in about 111 AD and finding Christians. He wanted to find Christians so that he could make them not be Christians anymore. He felt like Christians were a threat to the empire, and so he would go find Christians, find those who were reported on to be Christians. People were telling on each other. People were turning each other in. When he found that there were people who were Christians, he'd bring them out before the populace. He'd send incense before them and tell them you need to burn this incense and offer incense to the gods and proclaim that the emperor is a god. And he said, if they'll do that, then I'll let them off the hook. But if they won't do that, I put them to the death penalty. Pliny wrote these words back to Trajan, the emperor, in a document. An anonymous document was laid before me, he says, containing many people's names. In other words, someone anonymously turned in a bunch of Christians. An anonymous document was laid before me containing, containing many people's names. Some of these denied they were Christians or had ever been so. At my dictation, they invoked the gods and did reverence with incense and wine to your image, which I ordered to be brought for this purpose along with the statues of the gods. They also cursed Christ... So a lot of people gave in. He brought the gods, he brought the incense, an image of Caesar, and he said, you bow down to these. And a lot of people said, well, I never knew about Christ, never heard about him. And then he said, they cursed Christ, and as I in, am informed that people who are really Christians cannot possibly made to do any of these things, I considered that the people who did them should be discharged. What he's admitting is that by around 111 A.D., there were still people who were willing to go to their death saying that Christ had been resurrected from the dead. And that's not that far from the actual events. That's just a couple of generations. And then there was a Jewish source named Josephus who wrote something that's come to be known as the Testimonium Flavium. And it's been augmented by some people to make us believe that Josephus was some sort of believer. But Josephus was not a believer as far as I can tell. And here's what he wrote. 
Now there arose, and this is in its unaugmented form, its pre-augmented form. Now there arose about this time, talking about the time of 30 AD, this, there arose about this time a source of further trouble in one Jesus, a wise man who performed surprising works. He's not calling him the son of God, but he is saying he's wise. And he's not saying he did miracles, but he is saying he did surprising works. He goes on to say he was a teacher of men who gladly welcome strange things. So he's insulting Christians. He's insulting the people that follow him. He led away many Jews and also many of the Gentiles. He was the so-called Christ, Josephus says. When Pilate, another historical reference to Pontius Pilate, acting on information supplied by the chief men among us, condemned him to the cross, those who had attached themselves to him at first did not cease to cause trouble, and the tribe of Christians which has taken this name from him, Christians, follower of Christ, is not extinct even today. He didn't like Christ, but he admitted that Christ existed. Now fast forward about 1900 years. In the 1900s, Will Durant was an eminent historian, probably the world's most eminent historian, and he was an unbeliever in Jesus Christ. He has many volumes on the history of the world that will fill up a bottom shelf about that wide. In his volume 3, Caesar and Christ, on pages 555 and 557 in the, in the reference books that I have, in the editions that I have, he talks about these early writers and how they wrote about Christ. He says, they never denied him. They never denied that Jesus of Nazareth existed. Here's how he says it. The denial of that existence of Jesus seems never to have occurred even to the bitterest Gentile or Jewish opponents of nascent or early Christianity. That a few simple men should in one generation have invented so powerful and appealing a personality, so lofty an ethic and so inspiring a vision of human brotherhood would be a miracle far more incredible than any recorded in the Gospels. See what he says? If people would come together and try to invent something this good, they couldn't do it. I don't know how Will Durant reconciled that with his unbelief, but there's hostile testimony to the historicity of Jesus of Nazareth. So when people meet you and they say, I don't believe Jesus of Nazareth ever existed, don't be downgrading, don't mock them. The Apostle Paul taught, told us not to quarrel with people, but ask them to sit down and Google with you for a little bit. Search the historians for a little bit and see if you can show them some evidence that maybe they're wrong about their premature conclusions. Whether or not Jesus of Nazareth existed is one question. The next question is whether or not he really did these things that are recorded in the Gospels. Whether or not these Gospels are reliable documents. Because if they are, then Jesus is the Son of God and we owe him everything. But if they're frauds, then well, we're back to square one. Are these documents, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then the rest of the New Testament that testify to his existence, are they reliable documents? I can tell somebody, 1 Corinthians 15, 6 says that 500 people saw Christ resurrected from the dead. They saw him all at one time. I can tell people that, but if we can't establish that the New Testament is reliable, then they're not going to believe. Then they're not going to have a problem. Now to establish the reliability of New Testament documents is a long scholarly undertaking, but it's not too hard for the simple man. God never makes anything too hard for a simple man like me. We can understand it. We can understand how they get there. There are certainly some tests that are given to these documents to see whether or not they're true. It's called the literary test. To see whether or not documents that claim something actually were written about the time that they claim to have been written and by the people who claim to have written them. In other words, did Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John really write the Gospels? Did Paul really write all those epistles? Did John really write the Apocalypse? Was that all done in the first century as it claims to be? Were those the original authors? Those are the questions that people are trying to find out. And to do it, they apply historically literary tests that are applied to any other historical document. Aristotle, Socrates, Plato. If anything was written by anybody at that time, if anything claims to have been written by anybody at that time, the historians want to go back and check all the documents and see, well, 
can we believe that this document came from that time? I'm trying to think of an illustration that might make it a little bit easier and let me try this one on you. It's a new one I haven't ever tried before. Let's suppose that I want to forge a document and I want to make people believe that there was some historic event that happened here 200 years ago and I uh, might write something I kind of copy from the style of script that they had on the Declaration of Independence and I do some manipulation of it maybe even some photoshopping and print out a document and then I put it in a weathered envelope or something like that and put it in some kind of container and maybe I can sneak into the mound after hours and I can dig a hole deep enough to bury it there and then maybe leave some clues somewhere else that somebody might go find it let's suppose I could do all of that large undertaking first of all and that ought to tell us something it's hard for people to make a fraud. People try it, but they're usually caught. But let's suppose I could get all that done. Now the first thing the historians are going to want to know is this. Oh, did these things 200 years ago that Andy claimed really happen? Did these things signed by some person named Robison found in the mound, did they, th was this really written by a guy named Robison back at that time? Well, they might go search records to see if there was a guy named Robison that lived back at that time. But the other thing that might, they might do that might concern us this morning is if this is not just a personal letter, but it purports to be some sort of circulating letter, some sort of circulating document, some sort of circulating book, if it purports to be that, they're going to want to see if there are other copies out there somewhere. They'll search other historical, archaeological sites in the Moundsville, Ohio Valley area, and there are a lot of them if you look. They'll search other sites and they'll say, can we find anything else like this that anybody might have copied? And then maybe someone will say, oh, we found one up here in Wellsburg, we found one down there in New Martinsville, and they could compare them, but they won't for mine because mine's a fraud. They will for ancient documents that are real. And there's a historical process by which they come to examine them and see couple of points to make about that process is this. The more manuscripts they find, the better. If you're talking about a secular manuscript or something that claims to be sacred, the more manuscripts they find, the better. They can compare them to see, was this close to what was originally... Remember, they didn't have the Xerox machines. They had human copyists that supposedly might have made errors at some point. And so they want to see, let's compare all these manuscripts and see if this gets close to what was originally written. And then the second point they want to make is how early do we think it was, how close do we think it was to the time that it claims to have been written. Well, imagine with me, if you will, another way to do this timeline that I always do. Let's imagine that the expanse of my hands here is 1,400 years. On your left, about 400 years before Christ, about the area of my palm there, about the time of Christ, and over here, about 1100 A.D., about a thousand years ago. All right, you with me so far? Over here is just a little before Christ, and over here is about a thousand years later. Now let's talk about some of the manuscripts that we have from people. Aristotle wrote about 343 B.C., something like that, about the tip of my fingers out here on, on your left and my right. And the earliest manuscripts we have of his are from about A.D. 1100. And we have about five of them to compare. And nobody doubts that Aristotle actually wrote those things back in 343 B.C. Then we have Plato, who was a little bit before Aristotle, so a little bit beyond my fingertips there. And we have hit the earliest manuscript we think we have of Plato's is from about 900 A.D., so back up just a little bit here about 1,200 years apart, or 1,300, 1,400 years apart. I'm not real good at math, but you see the distance. And the number of manuscripts we have to compare of Plato's is seven. Nobody doubts that Plato wrote those things. Caesar's Gaelic Wars history was written about 58 to 50 B.C., so on in here just a little bit. And the earliest manuscript we have of it is about 950 A.D., so we're getting a little bit closer, about 1,000 years apart. And the number of manuscripts that we have of it are about 10. Nobody doubts that Caesar wrote those histories of the Gallic Wars. Tacitus, who we mentioned a little bit ago, lived about A.D. 100. So in here a little bit farther. The earliest manuscripts we have of his are about A.D. 1100. We have about 20 of those and nobody doubts that Tacitus wrote those. Pliny wrote about the same time. 
The earliest manuscripts we have are about 850, and we have about seven of those. Suetonius wrote just a little bit later, and the earliest manuscripts of his we have are about 950. We have eight manuscripts of those. Now let's talk New Testament. The New Testament claims to have been done before A.D. 100. Now the atheists come along and say that's a fraud, it couldn't have been. It had to have been done three or four hundred A.D. by people who are trying to get you to believe in Christ retroactively. That's what the atheists say, that's what the unbelievers say. But the Bible's claims and the early Christians' claims were that the Bible was written, the New Testament was completed by 100 A.D. Do you know where on the spectrum the earliest manuscript we have is? Right about here. Right about 120 A.D. And do you know how many New Testament manuscripts we have to compare to one another to see if they match up with what we think the originals would have been? 5,000 plus. If these didn't have supernatural elements recorded in them, and if these did not demand some sort of behavior that men don't want to do, there would be absolutely no question that they are the most verified documents known to mankind. They're historical. That ought to tell us something. The reason that people don't believe them is because of an anti-supernatural bias. Well, there can't be a God. No way there's a God. This is the age of enlightenment. And that's the only reason that people won't believe them. They meet all the tests of historical veracity, truthfulness, that are applied to any other document. Furthermore, archaeology comes along and starts confirming. Archaeology is what started in the 1800s, something like that. We started digging up the civilizations from that time. And the archaeologists got a little bit arrogant for a while and they'd say, there's no such thing as a Hittite nation like Joshua mentioned because we never found the Hittites. And then in 1901 they dig up the whole Hittite palace and their whole law code. There was never a Sargon of Assyria like Isaiah mentions and then they dig up his palace. And so by the time we get to 2021 and a little bit before that, you have all kinds of archaeological discoveries that have backed up the names, places, and events that are mentioned in the Bible. Jerry Moffat says over 30 names of emperors, high priests, Roman governors, princes, etc. are mentioned in the New Testament and all but a handful have been verified. In every way the Bible accounts have been found accurate though vigorously challenged. In no single case does the Bible let us down in geographical accuracy. Remember the nautical accuracy of Acts 27 and 28 from a week or so ago? Without one mistake, the Bible lists around 45 countries. Each is accurately placed and named. About the same number of cities are named, and no one mistake can be listed. Further, about 36 towns are mentioned, and most have been identified. Wherever accuracy can be checked, minute detail has been found correct every time in the New Testament. And let me just say by way of passing, because it's another study, that the Old Testament, everybody believes. The most skeptical person has to believe was done by 250 years before Christ. Now, we believe it was done by 400 years before Christ. That's what the Bible attests to. But you have to believe, you have to admit it was done by 250 years before Christ because there's wide attestation that the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament, was published from Alexandria, Egypt, the great library center, at that time. You can't deny it. So then all those prophecies that point to something that was fulfilled in the New Testament, completed before 100 A.D., well, they actually all were written before 250, before 400 B.C., 400 years before Christ came. And all those things that claim to have been done in the first century really were done in the first century, and that's significant because the documents, as I harp on often, would not have survived if they had been fraudulent written to that generation. The miracles recorded are out there done in the presence of many witnesses. 5,000 men plus women and children are fed on that mountain. Do you think they told anybody about that? Do you think they told their children about it? Do you think they told their grandchildren about it? Do you think about 130 A.D. someone says, Oh, I'm reading this Gospel of Matthew and I know it to be true because great grandma told me about that incident. She was there. If you had 500 years separated forgeries, you wouldn't have that element. But those documents would have been snuffed out. And as a matter of fact, we find documents that were snuffed out at that time. Like you find the Gospel of Thomas or the Gospel of Peter. And people 
who are atheists will be all excited. Well, see, this was left out of the Bible. Should, should have been there. No, it wasn't in the Bible because it claimed things that never happened. And the early Christians knew it. And God, guided by his providence, the people who would select the manuscripts, keep the manuscripts for us to have down through the ages. These documents are so historical. Except that people have an anti-supernatural bias. You know, the Bible even mentions that people will have an anti-supernatural bias. There's a great passage that's wide, widely applicable in 2 Peter chapter 3, starting at verse 3. If we'll just start in the middle of a sentence. Peter says, Knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts. People say, well, I want to do what I want to do, so I'm not going to believe in Jesus Christ. That's a scoffer. <coughs> I believe this way and not what Jesus told me to believe. That's a scoffer. Scoffers will come in the last days, he predicted, walking according to their own lust, just doing whatever they wanted to do, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? Where's this idea that Christ is going to come back? Where's this idea Jesus is going to return? That's what they'll say. And why will they say that? Well, they'll go on to explain themselves. For since the fathers fell asleep, since all our generations died ahead of us, since our fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. The laws of nature stay the same. That's what Peter says the scoffers will say. And isn't that what they say? Oh, the world is billions and billions of years old because the Colorado River eats away at the Grand Canyon by a millimeter every thousand years. And if that calculation, we can calculate back to a few billion years old. And they forget that the mini Grand Canyon, as some people call it, was formed by Mount St. Helens in a couple of hours in 1980. What about the possibility of a global flood that moved along the speed of things faster. Maybe things didn't always continue as they are now. That's the doctrine of uniformitarianism. Now apply it to the miracles of Christ. Laws of nature. Dead people stay dead. I agree. People don't walk on water. I agree. People don't take one boy's lunch and feed thousands of people. Fully agreed. Why do you believe in Jesus then? Well, because these documents are so historically testified by so many people that saw these things happen back then, and because people went to their deaths believing that these things happened, they wouldn't recant. They believed these things happened and they wouldn't recant. They didn't go out killing anybody else in the name of their religion, but they passively accepted what came to them because they believed in the things that were recorded there. And why should it be thought incredible that God raises the dead? And further this, there wouldn't be any natural law if we expected miracles every generation. Emmanuel Doherty spoke on this at great detail and with great eloquence and information in his gospel meeting here. If we had to have miracles in every generation to prove to us that there is a God, then there wouldn't be miracles. That would be, the hap that would be what happens. That would be the order of the day. But the fact of the matter is, history has seen miracles at only a few very brief times in history. When God wanted to confirm the law of Moses at Exodus chapter 19 and 20, back at the beginning of the world when he made things when nobody was around to see them, but people were able to see them at the confirming of the law of Moses, ten plagues, Red Sea crossing, thunder and lightning on the mountain, a few other things. A few isolated times during Israel's history when there was some trouble, and then during the first century when God wanted to say, this is the law that I always planned to send. This is my son whom I always planned to send. And I wanted you to know that this is he. I wanted you to know that this is the one. I wanted you to know that this is the one that you should follow. How should we know him? Lots of teachers come along. Lots of fake messiahs come along. How should we know him? Well, he can walk on water and, pe and 12 disciples can attest to it. Well, he can go raise Lazarus and Mary and Martha can attest to it. And he can raise from the dead himself and over 500 can see him at one time and that document be written 20 years later while those people were still alive. And, and he can raise from the dead and more than 40 people, and people see him for more than 40 days. And then people keep going to their death saying, yes, I saw him, yes, I saw him, yes, I saw him. Why can we believe those things happened? Why can we believe this word? Those miracles happened to confirm this word. Mark chapter 16 verse 20. 
These things were written. Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, John said. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and believing you might have life in his name. And Hebrews chapter 2 verses 1 through 4 urges these Hebrew Christians who were thinking of going back to Judaism after being in Christianity that they ought to take more earnest heed to the things they've heard lest they drift away. For the word spoken through angels, that was the old law, proved steadfast and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward. And now we really ought to give attention to this law, this new law of Christ because God bore witness to it through signs, miracles, and wonders. God bore witness to it, Hebrews 2 verse 4. And how did he do that? This fellow can raise the dead. I, I think I'll follow him. But people were so hard-hearted, even back then, that when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, all they could think about was killing Lazarus. Do they not think he can do it again? And then the next thing they could think about was killing Jesus. As if their torturous means of death could hold down the author of life. No. Something outside the parameters of nature happened. Something outside the parameters of nature was recorded. And God, by His providence, left us enough documents that it would be undeniable that these documents are historical. That's why we ask people to believe Jesus. Simply because it's true. And you might say to the skeptic, if it's so true, why doesn't everybody believe it? Well, a couple of things. Jesus said most people wouldn't in Matthew 7, 13 and 14. But there's one other reason that you might try to drill in. It's found in Romans 1 verse 18. They suppress the truth in unrighteousness. When people are unrighteous, they don't want you to know the truth. And when people in power are unrighteous, they really don't want you to know the truth. Emperor Hirohito of World War II Japan surely didn't want his people to know Christianity because then they wouldn't have worshipped him and committed kamikaze acts in worship of him. And Hitler certainly didn't want people to believe that Jesus was the Christ because then they wouldn't follow his ungodly evil schemes and people who get in power who are ungodly and don't have some respect for the Jesus of Nazareth who is the Christ want to suppress the truth in unrighteousness that's what happens in our age that's what happens in a post-Christian world but you have the opportunity to believe the truth and those of you who have believed the truth have the responsibility the responsibility to do whatever you can to help people have access to the truth in the face of an ungodly world. This morning, the truth of the matter is that Jesus said, if people will believe in me and repent of their sins and confess me before men and be baptized for the remission of their sins, then they can be saved and have that eternal hope in heaven. There's the end reason for believing in Jesus is hope, but it's not a false hope. That's why I didn't start there. The real reason for believing in Jesus is that's the absolute truth. But then it brings us this glorious hope beyond the grave. And if you're one of those folks who started believing in Jesus and was baptized but then started falling away, oh, come back to him before it's too late. Make your move while there's still an earth. Don't be a scoffer who says, oh, I have tomorrow. Well, I got next week. No, come back to him now while you know you're still breathing. If we could help you, please come as we stand and sing.